Welcome to another th- season of the Around the House podcast. My name is Jordan Baldick. I'm with Kevin and Jerry from Curling Zone. Jerry, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm uh, fantastic. You guys ready for another year of uh, curling talk? Yeah, a little late to the start, but a uh, busy start to the season uh, in a lot of things. has probably delayed this, but I think we've got uh, some interesting topics to cover today. Jerry, Jerry, I hear you're a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the uh, managed to uh, have a clip of an interview I did on, with CBC, uh, the National, make its way onto uh, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> so take us through take us through your Saturday morning uh, yesterday and and what uh, how you found out and. Uh, and then uh, tell us about uh, you know what the what's happened since. Well, I'd actually seen it on uh, the Curling News blog. It was the first place I'd seen it. Uh, nobody had actually messaged me. I came across the video, and and then all of a sudden, uh, I think George had written that uh, that I ended up in it. So I'm like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you're going to get in a situation like that. But uh, watched the clip, and uh, it was pretty cool. Lots of uh, friendly messages from friends and, and colleagues and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's been pretty exciting. And, and the great thing about it, too, is to see curling get this kind of coverage on in mainstream uh, U.S. media now. And, of course, this is all over uh, the broom debate, um, as people lazily like to call it, broomgate. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really taken over our sport right now, and it's something that I think is... Uh, it is a difficult position for the sport as there's no easy answers and no solutions that uh, that aren't going to impact somebody one way or another. Have you uh, have you heard anything from like you said now that's you know in in the mainstream U.S. media? Have you heard anything from any casual fans during? I know it's sort of a it happened only a couple of days ago, but you never know. Well, I think uh, when you talk about the debate, it's. It's kind of a case that uh, you know some of the top players have learned how to utilize uh, specific types of brooms and materials, and you know we call you know it's it's been tagged as directional fabric. I think uh, one of the broom manufacturers, Hardline, uh, uh, will uh, debate that whether that their broom actually falls into that category. But I think what they've actually you know they've put these uh, brooms under under microscopes and. Uh, there's a there's a poster on uh, Curling Zone who uh, who's done a lot of research called Rock, uh, his name's Rock Doc, and uh, sounds like he's been working with uh, Canadian Curling Association to kind of identify some fabrics that are that are at issue and and the, and the biggest issue with these fabrics is that they're more pressed fabric rather than than a stitched or woven fabric. So what ends up happening is it's almost like it's plasticized. And what they're doing is they're measuring in, in microns. It's a little bit over my head. But uh, essentially measuring in one direction versus the other, they don't actually align in, in, a, in a similar uh, depth. So I, this is what they tag as directional fabric, whether that's a... I think it's a pretty poor label for, for, for the, the fabric. Um, I think more the idea behind why they call it directional is because if you sweep a certain way, you can, you know, you can do different things with the ice. So, well, maybe let's let's take a step back on the timeline here, right? So, although it's sort of really reached, you know, a real um, pressure cooker early in this season, the actual uh, conversations and some of the um, the views on this started even going back into la- or the beginning of last season, right, Jerry? That some of some of the teams were noticing some different behaviors. The hardline broom came out in, I guess, the year previous to that. Uh, but yeah, I think the hardline broom's been widely available for. This is the third year now. I believe they've been making it and building it and developing it uh, for five years now. So you know, this is not new, and and the hardline brush itself is not. Uh, uh, totally new to the sport, and I think that's why there's so much controversy over, you know, whether you know the average club curler, even the average uh, you know competitive curler that plays, uh, 
in uh, you know a handful of regional tour events and maybe the odd World Curling Tour event, they you know they don't believe it. They don't believe this effect, uh, and they think you know the elite players are full of shit and and creating a storm here for the sake of uh, uh, other reasons, which would be you know corporate uh, issues. But I've talked to enough teams. I've seen it myself that uh, you know you can do things with these types of brooms that you know many will say go against the natural physics of curling. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. What what are the natural physics of curling? Because even the the actual um, movement of a rock is actually the opposite of what is usually expected, right? And there hasn't really been a lot of study, even though this is a four or five hundred year old game. There hasn't really been a lot of analysis. I know there were some guys out of Vancouver, Jerry. You told me uh, the other day that there's some guys out of Europe that have done some other studies. Like, what is it that actually creates the movement in the rock? Well, there was two studies, two very differing, differing opinions on why a rock curls. And I believe the group out of, out of BC, I think it was Vancouver, like you were mentioning, I don't, I don't uh, know the names offhand, but they talked about heating of the ice and causing, uh, you know, causing thin uh, layer of water. I think that the thin layer of water moisture was, was uh, somewhat disproven by the uh, Western Ontario study that... Uh, that uh, the Canadian Curling Association at the time was working with uh, towards On the Podium and Vancouver in 2010. And out of that came the uh, EQ head and has been licensed to Balance Plus. And, but what they found out then is there was no actual film of water created, but there was heating of the ice. So they were testing and generate, seeing what kind of heat the, would, uh, would come from, from sweeping the ice. Then the other the other study in was done in Sweden, and uh, a university there. And what they did is they figured that it was actually micro scratches on the ice that was causing a stone to curl. And so what would happen is, is the leading edge, the front edge of the stone, would actually scratch the ice, and the back end edge of the stone, the trailing edge, would actually pick up those scratches. And pull the stone in a direction to, to make it curl. Because if you slide a glass on a smooth bar surface, for example, and you put a little spin on it, it actually curls in a different direction than a curling stone does. Because there's there's very little friction. Whereas on, on ice with the, you know, you'll see this with sandpapered curling stones. When they paper them, it'll roughen the uh, running edge, running surface, which will then make more scratches in the leading edge and, uh, and grab harder in the in the back. And I think with, uh, the discussion here with brushes, I, I think we can theorize that, uh, and, and we've seen much more evidence now that, uh, what these brushes are doing with these, uh, uh, these directional fabrics is they are actually scratching the ice. And so now you're adding extra scratches to the, in front of the stone, which allows you to then, you know, make a rock, fall at times make it curl more and there's been a lot of uh, a, a lot of issues with that yeah I, th so. I, I think the interesting thing and and the struggle for uh, the hardline organization and if, if anyone's interested they should listen to Dean Gemmel's podcast uh, he has an interview with the um, the president of hardline uh, I believe it is right Jerry uh, yeah the Archie uh, Manavian I think is how you'd say his last name the interesting thought there was that, you know, they had submitted a broom to the Canadian Curling Association, uh, Curling Canada, so, you know, some time ago. And, you know, part of it was maybe that a lot of the, you know, the, the governing bodies were a little caught off guard by this, or part of it was a lot of the governing bodies, like take the, the Curling Canada, they, they have the interest of the game. They also have the interest of Canada to be successful, part of the own the podium. So if you even go back to the EQ, you know, they were looking for advantages, Right, so the idea of putting a foil insert as an example and trying to create more heat. I mean, there's there's a lot of work being done, and I'm sure it's it's something that could continue unless the governing bodies, whoever they might we want to call them, then start to make a decision to do some type of uh, testing. So you know, in the example here, we've got a case of seasons already started. We have a product that's been out for a while. The manufacturer of that product um, has 
you know, built uh, inventory to meet the demands of the season, and all of a sudden, uh, there this conversation that started in last year in back rooms has boiled up into you know a letter for a bunch of players, and all of a sudden the governing bodies are behind the times, and I think it seems like somebody should have figured out this was going to happen sooner or later. Don't don't you guys think? I think it's a I think it's a big fail by the world oh, curling federation and curl canada now we didn't you can never specifically pinpoint you know what it was going to be but you could have gone to sweeping as the thing that is the exploitable tactic by teams but like not on purpose but i think i go back i listened to dean gemmel's podcast from yesterday he had a uh, uh glenn howard on to discuss uh to discuss the whole broom situation and glenn mentioned that uh, in the off season, I believe that uh, Brad Gushu was signed on as the third hardline team, and uh, like they did a bunch of testing testing in the off season, and you know Brad, Brad figured that you know he could uh, get a, in some situations it's more effective for him to sweep with one sweeper. Talk going back to the scratches in the ice, as Jerry said, but uh, you know I think Brad Gushu's team did bring their results to Curl Canada, but you know Curl Canada never really made a statement or had anything in place to start the season. Yeah. Yeah. That was something that, uh, yeah. Gush's team did do that. They did put, the, they did submit that. And, and the whole purpose of it was, uh, you know, it sounds like they had, they had an issue with it and they didn't like what it was doing to the game at the time. And, uh, you know, when, when nothing came of it, they decided, you know what, we, you know, we struggled against, uh, Carruthers and McEwen last year. You know, McEwen, understandable. You know, they've been the best team in the game probably for the last four or five seasons. So uh, it's not brushes that have uh, have done it for them. Um, Carruthers' team, hard to say where they would fall uh, otherwise. They're a very good team, lots of experience there. But Gushu found that they were 1-9 last season against those two teams. And they were beating everybody else uh, quite regularly. So they decided to, to give up a you know, a fairly lucrative sponsorship deal with Goldline and chose to go with Hardline instead uh, for uh, less money, but they figured they would make up the difference uh, on the tour season. So I think at the end of the day, their decision has probably been, you know, the right decision for themselves personally as a team. Uh, but one of the other things that we've that's come out of this is the one sweeper, as Jordan was mentioning, and, and that works with every broom. Yeah. It's something now where uh, that is something we're going to see in the game going forward unless they somehow mandate that when you sweep, both brushes have to be on the ice. Because what ends up happening is, is when you have two brushes, you're actually counteracting each other. And, and from, from, from the theory of a lot of people out there is that it doesn't matter what material you have, you're still micro-scratching the pebble even with EQs and Norway pads and, and uh, even your standard synthetic brush and even hair brushes to an extent will do the same thing too. And so when you're, when you've got a, you know, they theorize the front brush will do about 75% of the work or 70 to 75% of the work. And the second brush will do about 20 to 25%. So when you're sweeping, countering each other from opposite sides of the stone, you're only doing 40% of the work. If you remove the front sweeper, you've still got the 70 at least. So you're actually wasting energy by sweeping with two sweepers. The other option is you you move back to having two sweepers on the same side, which anyone that's only started watching curling in the last decade probably hasn't seen before. I don't know if that's something, Jerry, that you've seen recently either with some European teams or... I haven't seen anybody actually executing on it as a uh, from a uh, starting point. But at times, you'll see sweepers pivot behind the stone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the kind of thing where I think you're going to see uh, more of this happen in the future. Um, you know, if, you, if you're throwing a, a hit of some sort and, you, you know, you need to, to keep it straight, you know, you may see two sweepers on one side of the stone in the future. But the one thing, though, is that the sweeper on the other side can affect the curl. So you can actually make rocks curl more now too. So it it makes sense that when you're wide on a hit, 
the sweeper on the outside of the curl, meaning, you know, if you, if you look at the curl as a C, for example, if you're on the outside of the C and you're wide on a hit, you should be sweeping with the outside sweeper. Now, this all, this all uh, also was created, uh, if anyone that curled years ago uh, would, would know that the sweeping rules previously were a lot more restrictive, right, Jerry? They had, you had to, you know, move the broom head across the entire path of the rock. There were, you know, a lot more details. The rules have, have since changed dramatically to allow what we would all then, you know, call a corner sweep. Uh, I don't know that that's an avenue that we could consider to go back to that. Uh, it's really hard to actually officiate that, I would imagine. But I don't know. Do you, Jordan that's or Jerry, get thoughts on that? That's the issue is the officiating part. And the rules were loose, loosened for the sake of minimizing uh, the need for officials to have to have an influence on the game. Well, at the time, though, we also wanted more curl, right? That was that happened as we were Except coming out nobody, of the nobody Nobody knew you could actually make rocks curl like you actually do. Yeah. It, it had nothing to do with more curl, nothing had to do with any of those other reasons. It really had to do with the interpretation of, of the sweeping rule and what's okay and what's not. And, you know, the horse is out of the barn now. If, you know, if we go back to tighter sweeping rules... You know, these teams know how much they can affect a stone by sweeping it to curl. And if you're, you know, I saw examples, uh, women's teams throwing rocks in, in, a, in a fairly well set up test. You know, this wouldn't be something that would ever be able to withstand uh, full broom te- full testing for standards and stuff. But between these two women's teams, they were able to get uh, 12 to 16 inches difference in whether they swept the inside of the running path to hold it straight to the middle, mid-level reaction of an of a unswept stone to sweeping the stone for curl. And this was on board to hack weight hits mm-hmm. that you could actually influence a stone by 12 to 16 inches. That's yeah. huge. Yeah, it's huge. A, it's- uh, over 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 a foot difference. So, yeah, that's 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 the difference from hitting the stone on the outside to nosing it to hitting it on the inside. Yeah, it, go, like, it, go, it goes back to that conversation about what's the allowable percentage that sweeping should impact the shot. Yeah, exactly. And, and these and this was done. Don't don't get me wrong here. This was not done with with uh, the hard line in the normal form. This was. They used three brushes, and they all they concluded they were all very much the same in results. And this was the inverted ice pad, which which is uh, the pad turned inside out, which is similar to an EQ uh, material, with a regular EQ head, and with a Norway pad. And they were able to get similar results, you know, in keeping it straight and making it curl with all three uh, materials. Well, and I think that's one thing you bring up then that might have people concerned in the way this is being shaped as a uh, a corporate uh, battle between two companies. You know, I think if everyone is pointing at a particular broom, I think people also want to stop and say, well, what about the one I'm using, right? And and what is it now capable of? And, and maybe we just didn't focus on it enough and examine it enough to see what we could do. And now we're learning more about it and we're, be, you know, we're becoming more um, capable of manipulating stones. So, uh, you know, I think that's where if people start to think, okay, this is a witch hunt to come out against the company. You know, I, you know, I think you know Glenn Howard was on. We talked about that the uh, the Dean Gemmel's um, interview the other day. Jordan, you mentioned. You know, I absolutely believe Glenn. You know, believes in the integrity of the game. He's played it for years, and he is starting to see things that you know concern him. Right now, the question that maybe Glenn might have to ask, and he's maybe not even talking openly about it, is well, what about the equipment even that I'm using, and Maybe we haven't been using it to its full effect, and so does that also create an issue? And and is that something that's been talked about, Jerry? Um, to a point, I think. You know, I think part of it too is, you know, I don't want to call those guys, you know, old or anything, but there's there's a difference between the physical strength and the fitness level of Team Howard sweepers and take Mike McEwen sweepers or Reed Carruthers' team, or Kevin Cooey's team. And, you know, you're you still, in talking to some of these teams, you know, they can do things with brushes that, 
you know, they can't, uh, that they know it comes from strength. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of it I wonder is, you know, Howard's team, you know, are they able to keep up with, uh, you know, some of the other teams? And, you know, sweeping is definitely going to be an issue with that team. You know, it's, it just naturally happens, you know, your peak level in, in, in sport, in the athletic uh, part of the game, you're probably looking at uh, 25 to 35 in curling for front ends. Very few are, very few front ends uh, are older than that. Yeah. Hey, hey, question, Jordan. So as a fan, what, how much do you care? I mean, how much do you care, do you think, that, uh, the the sweeping becomes a bigger part of being able to manipulate the the shot and create a different game. Does it is it that apparent to you? Is it as as important to you as it might be I, to the players? I think there's two schools of thought. There's two type of fans. I'm more of a hardcore fan, if anything, because I've been curling my entire life and I still curl once a week and I still care about the sport. But I think there's there's going to be your TV your TV fan person that watches. All, all the you know the Scott, the Scotties and the Briar, and they're going to tune into some of the Grand Slimes, and they might not give a crap. Now, for myself, my my biggest issue is that I believe that these type of rules have to be done in the off season because you enter the season on a set of rules. Now, if it's a, if if it's an extreme case, which this sounds like it is amongst all the top teams in the world, then uh, decisions by the World Curling Federation and Curl Canada or Curl Canada must be made but i also think of it as from a recreational curling standpoint where take someone like me i own a hardline broom an ice pad too i bought it at the end of last year and i think to myself well i'm lucky that i i always keep a backup broom around i have a old ashram broom that i use and i think to myself as you know if i go into the mca bond spiel in january which is technically a play down event because it has spots the provincials at hand I know that Curl Canada is going to make a decision sooner or later, and they're probably going to align with the World Curling Federation, is that I'm not going to be out $200 right away, but I am not going to be able to use the broom that I paid my money with. And I think there's a lot of people in my, in my, in my shoes which, you know, they're going to have to do something to the broom, which might cost them extra money, which is money out of their pocket. And I, I can't imagine Hardline is going to, you know, offer a free service to all the people that have brought in their brooms to get it uh, in line with the current rules. So I think if from a, a, resi- a, a, a club curler like myself, I hate being out the money because brooms aren't, aren't cheap. Well, and even, even if you look at golf, when they've made rulings, they've usually made those rulings well in advance. Like we're going to change the you know, allowable groove construction three years from now. We're going to make you no longer be allowed to anchor your putter to your body three years from now. Um, there's there's usually, and, and again, golf, I, I would imagine, seems to have a lot more funding in, in terms of looking at technology. Uh, but, you know, who knows? If we went back, you know, 20 years, it's likely that, that golf wasn't prepared. Um, you know, if you remember in 2000 when Tiger was winning all those tournaments, and not to take away from Tiger's skill and ability... But he was using a new Nike constructed ball that was a four piece ball, and all the other guys were using Titleist Balladas. And there was a real push from from Titleist at the time to get that Pro V one out to market because they had to compete. And then all of a sudden the ball has never been the same. And it goes it flies straighter. It uh, you don't need to be as much of a shot maker as you did in, in the old Ballada construction. And I'm I'm willing to bet at that stage back then the you know, the USGA or the USGA and the the, the RNA probably weren't prepared for what was happening at the time. So, and, and they had all the resources and money more so than likely the WCF and, and Curl Canada has. So it, it's, there's going to be playing catch up, but I, I agree. Like there, there is an argument to be made that says nothing's going to happen until next year and continue to play as you did last year. And there would be lots of griping and lots of complaining. But I think, you know, part of what's adding a bit of questions to all this is balance plus and their involvement in sponsorship of these organizations and even if there is nothing at play here, it certainly raises questions. And it's something that I think has brought about even more, more thoughts to should those kind of companies be involved at that level. Um, but, uh, I, you, know, you know, my thought is I agree with you completely, Jordan. The timing is terrible. And I do really think there is a discussion to be had that, you know, maybe nothing has to be done right now. But we're probably already past that because we've got various tours, various organizations. Um, 
but you know the CCA is and or sorry Curl Canada is in an interesting spot because they allowed the hardline broom two years ago. They have to be very cautious about what they they do and don't say at this stage. So we'll we'll see. It remains to be seen. I think what uh, what'll happen there. Yeah, and this right. this sort of comes into you know you talk about the golf ball as well, and you know does the sport have allowable tolerance for that kind of improvement in the game? And I think you know for for the for the mid level sports fan who kind of pays half attention to golf, I'd suggest there was room for that for an improved ball that allows allows better shot making and and all that because you can do things like making the golf courses more difficult. You know, you can tighten up the fairways to to make uh, uh, make uh, golfers have to be even more accurate and and uh, play their shots even better. You know, add more bunkers, add more hazards, all kinds of stuff like that can be done to kind of counteract that ball technology. This brings into the question with curling. You know, what can we do to counter counter? You know, the the brushing being more effective and. And I think this is the crux of the issue here is that, you know, in the past, a, a curling brush is really only meant to take a rock further and keep it straighter. So, you know, it allow you to add, you know, 10, maybe 10 feet of distance on a, on a draw, for example. Or you could keep the line a little bit later or a little bit uh, straighter by delaying the break point by sweeping a stone. What seems to be happening with some of these new materials is that you can make a rock fall you can make it curl more, which they've identified while not realizing that every brush could actually make a rock curl more in, in the past. So I think there's one part of it is, you know, we're in a new in a new reality with, with sweeping to make rocks curl, and I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to change that. But then the question is, you know, is it okay that the rock goes the opposite, that you can make a rock fall on ice that's supposed to be curling four or five feet, and if that's the case, you can essentially pinball a stone down the sheet. And, you know, if you oversweep it one direction, you, you hit it with the other brush and you sweep it back. And that's what they were kind of terming joysticking at the end of the day. And, you know, I, I'm to a point where I kind of feel like some of this is, is good for the game because we do have room for improved shot making. But at the same time, you know, how much of actually throwing a good stone should should factor into making shots you know should it be 75 percent on the delivery execution of the stone coming close to the brush and tweaking with the with the with the brushing or now it's now to a point where where some are suggesting that it's almost the opposite where you know you throw it close you know you throw it reasonably close to the broom and when i say reasonably close within six inches and the sweepers can uh, can uh, just fix any issues with the with the delivery. So essentially, you know, you can slide out of the hack, close your eyes, and just let it go, and let the sweepers do the work. I was going to say, I think that there's two ways that this has to be governed. I think the we've talked about it a little bit. Like the brooms have to be governed. I think from a standpoint of the materials that can be used, I'm fine with that. But then you also have to come down to a point where we talked about earlier, like. How can teams sweep the rock? Now, if, you know, the WCF or Curl Canada came out with the rule is that when you're sweeping, both brooms have to be down. I think I'm totally against that because I think Gushu has proved that having a second sweeper sometimes can be counterintuitive. And I don't want I don't want there to be a mechanic in the game where you're actually hurting your your chances at making a shot because you have to have a second broom down. I can think the, I, and and what happens if that person that has that second broom down? How do you police how hard they're sweeping? Oh, they're right, not, they're not, they, yeah. they could just literally be hovering the broom over the ice. I mean, that it's I I'm more for trying to police as little as possible because this is a very delicate area to try to officiate. I even remember the rules of of having to go across the the path and where the the broom had to be. Some of those rules themselves, nobody actually followed them completely, and you know you could have arguments on the ice where people would say ah you're corner sweeping you're doing this and it was really hard it's hard to to really tell or know what's happening and what pressure is being placed so i i'm i'm for as little of that as possible and i'm more for you know trying to you know control the advancements in the technology but it's it's it may be difficult to do it's just something that's going to take some type of um 
you know, ruling, but I just think, you know, you got a 400 year old sport and you're making a ruling in a span of four weeks. Uh, actually, I mean, there's been two rulings. The WCF made a quick ruling uh, ahead of the Pacific uh, Championships, and then they came ahead and, and they've come up with another one. We might see something else. I'm, I'm sure this is not done before we reach the next Olympics, but I do think that, you know, there needs to be a kind of combined effort and some independent analysis that's done. But I think there is a debate because the debate is what should sweeping add to the game? Right. And, yeah. uh, and some people might still feel that it should do very little. And, you know, if it, if it strictly is just, you know, 10 feet plus um, holding back, you know, th- you know, six inches of curl, we're past that already. And I don't think we can get back to that. Yeah. One of the biggest things we need to make sure that uh, we stress to everybody involved in this situation is, is to have a, a bit of patience, you know, to, to, you know, now that now that it's being looked at and discussed, it, it really comes down to trying to figure out what's what's best. The hardline teams have bent over backwards trying to, uh, you know, evolve to satisfy a you know the gentleman's agreement that's put and put out there. They've inverted their brushes. They've been out on the ice testing with with uh, non hardline teams. So to suggest any of these teams are doing anything to to cheat the system. You know, to call these teams out as cheaters, I think is is a bit disingenuous at this point. Um, same thing at a club level. Uh, the the biggest thing, the the discovery about these brushes is is mostly about when they're absolutely brand new, out of the out of the box, and and they they have a little bit of extra sharpness to them that these teams were able to actually take advantage of. Oh, and used by Fisher's world team. class and world class yeah, sweepers, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. So it's a situation where, you know, a team like Gushu's team, they would actually have three different variations of a hardline pad for each of their players. And they would choose the, the brush they wanted to use based on the type of shot they wanted to use. And so for hits, they were pulling out, they wanted to have a brand new hardline pad on the inside of the C, inside of the curl, which would help make sure it keeps it straight. And so, you know, when, when they played other shots, for example, draws, they would use well-worn in in pads because it didn't affect the curl. It would just act like a normal curling brush. And this goes back to, you know, the strength of w- why the hardline brush is so great is that those pads last forever. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a perfect broom for club curlers. But we've we've heard of instances where where people are being called cheaters in their curling clubs. And, you know... I, I think this is going off the deep end by, you know, a lot of people who've heard a few rumors here and there, you know, no, there's no club curlers out there who are going to be doing what Gushu's team did and replacing their pad regularly to keep a brand new one to keep rock straight. You know, the club curlers are out there to go out and have, you know, have a good game and throw a few stones. And, and the hardline brush is still great for that. You know, it's got the longevity. Once you break a hardline brush in, it seems to be they're they're not a whole lot different than any other brush out there. And uh, you know, I want to make sure that until we get this sorted out, that you know, that we do away with this these kind of attitudes that have sort of filtered into 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 the game. Yeah. So so so, what do you think, Jordan? You think we've uh, we've covered it all? I think we've I think we've pounded it into the ground and we've given our thoughts. <laughs> Uh, anybody who's sick of this debate, we're not done with this for a long shot. Well, I think the great part is curling's in the news. You got, you know, the late show with Stephen Colbert. The Washington Post has had multiple articles. The, we made the New York Times. You know, what's next? Uh, Jerry, we hope to see you on uh, uh, see you on Kimmel soon and uh, and Jimmy Fallon. And maybe you'll get a live, uh, a live uh, interview. Who knows? Hey, maybe we get some of these guys out to Vegas for the Continental Cup in January. It'd be a great spot to see some some of these guys show up. That would be a perfect uh, time for that. Are you heading down there by any chance? Yeah, I think so. I haven't booked anything yet, uh, but uh, I'll probably end up down there. Uh, it's such a great event, and and uh, Vegas puts on such an amazing show. And it sounds like they're uh, close to selling everything out too, which is great to see. Well, I think uh, you better. You got your fifteen minutes, uh, Jerry. You better take advantage. You got it. 
if, uh, if someone actually recognizes you on the strip, that'll be a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Jelen, let's uh, maybe talk to some uh, results uh, recently. Uh, Grand Slam was last weekend, and we had uh, Holman and Gushu as the winners. Speaking of hardline teams, Gushu beat Crothers in the finals, gentlemen. Uh, thoughts from that event on both sides? I think the men's event, uh, Brad Gushu's team just continues to roll. doesn't matter what they're using. You know, Again, this weekend they're rolling through uh, – uh, a regional tour event in Halifax. They're into the final against Sven Mikkel. Uh Probably going to win it as as Gushu's team has been uh, been just crazy good this year. Um, Carruthers has probably got some nightmares from that game though. Second end, uh, his shot for four. It was a it was a reasonably makeable shot for four. And uh, they were pounding it out of his hand and just rubbed the front guard. Well, and a makeable shot for three. He didn't need to be that that tight to that shot. And to pick up three there or four isn't a huge difference. Yeah. It was a. Well, I just didn't throw it. it, was, well. it I was, think that's. Yeah, well, it, was it was the wrong wrong day. side to miss on for sure. Yeah, and so he papered the guard and still followed through, made contact with the uh, Gushu stone in the house, but uh, wasn't able to to hit it quite hard enough and and. Uh, Give up that steal of one instead of a score of four or you know minimum three, so that was really the turning point of the game. And I don't think Crothers' team ever really generated much offense after that. There was another strange point later in the game. I wrote about it in my uh, Curl with Math article that where he tried to play a double uh, on a sh- and, and there was the two the two rocks uh, one top four and he was back four, and it, it looked like maybe Gushu was shot. It was hard to tell. So he, you know, he played a double off of a shot that wasn't even in play. All he had to do was maybe just draw down to his back stone. Uh, actually, the shot that Gushu made to to draw for two, and that that deuce was huge. Uh, that was a strange call. I know both Mike and Kevin commented on it as well. That was maybe not a not a great decision, but yeah, yeah overall they just looked a bit out of sorts. But Gushu, this is it's nice that he's had the same team now for a, for how long? For at least two years. And I think that's good for him. Got some stability. Those guys are starting to really gel. Uh, you know, that that's one thing that maybe dogged Gushu a little bit over the years is a lot of change all the time was uh, was maybe not good for him. Takes takes a bit of time for teams, right, to to really get uh, get together. Now, McEwen's team's been together a long time. So let's just, you know, for them, it's just a matter of, you know, getting into the briar and uh, and seeing if they, if, if they can, uh, can win there because they certainly can win uh, everywhere else. Yeah, I think right now Mike is in the middle of uh, a bit of other issues, obviously, with, with the brushes and stuff. He's a, a distributor, sells for Hardline. I know the rumor is out there that he owns a, a, a stake in, in Hardline, but that's absolutely not true, and he's stressed that to me as well. But he is a dealer, and he does work and, and sell these brushes as, as kind of a part of his, uh, you know, this is how he generates some uh, money to make a living. And so he's been dealing a lot with, you know, trying to come up with solutions for the pads, for material, for everything else at the same time. And he's he's mentally drained from this. So I think that's taking some away from, from his game. They missed the playoffs in Oshawa. But of course, you know, they're still playing pretty damn good. They, they won the slam in Truro. They've been uh, posting some pretty strong results. So, you know, I... I'll give uh, I'll give those guys a benefit of the doubt since they've been you know the best team for five years now on a tour and and the points chase that that it's hard to uh, take anything away from those guys. So, so one thing I'm wondering we had uh, the skins in the past when we've had uh, women's teams participate. Do you, how do you think Homan's team would do straight up in a against the men in a in a Grand Slam? Do you think do you think they're a, a playoff caliber team? I think they're a borderline playoff team for sure. Like I think they beat, I think they beat uh, a lot of the teams outside the top ten on the order of merit. Uh, uh, you know, on I'm not saying they they walk over them, but I think they're a coin flip against pretty much anybody uh, outside the top ten. You throw them into the top ten, and it's hard to say for sure, but they'd be very competitive. So um, how many games have they lost this year, Jerry? Like I four, believe four, yeah. And Two of them were back to back. They're on something like a twenty game win streak now since they lost uh, back to back games at the uh, Autumn Gold in Calgary. So yeah, they're they're really unreal, and uh, you know I think uh, you know I think there's uh, more to come, more improvement to come out of that team as well. You know I, they are 
they are very good right now, and I think they still have room to get better. They uh, every time I watch Archer Holman curl, I just think a machine. Team's so good. Um, I think, like you said, they're gonna grow and they're gonna they're gonna push the limits of uh, how good they can be. I for the for the next five years for sure, and maybe even beyond that. Yeah, I would agree with that. And you know, I think some of this comes into uh, you know, I know we wanted to talk about the uh, seventh end of that uh, slam final between Flurry and Holman, uh, Joanne Courtney uh, and. And Lisa Weagle are sweeping Rachel's last draw, drawing against one, or so they believed. And uh, at the end, Rachel did come up light, and Joanne Courtney moved what what they believed at the time was third shot. So it was Flurry lying one, Holman supposedly lying second, and then this yellow stone that uh, Horgan, I guess Tracy Horgan, now Tracy Flurry, as she got married over the summer. Um, they were talking about measuring that stone for two. They'd actually not decided on the scoring. Uh, you know, usually you turn to the, the your opponent and say, you know, we good, one point, whatever. Uh, they didn't do that. They moved the stone. The rules in... I wanted to ask you this, Jerry, because the rules in Curling Canada are, are pretty explicit, that they state uh, that the team would be given a point. And so I, I don't... And although it's interesting, because again, I don't know how they would actually fully do that in an officiated, you know, uh, Scotty's event as an example. But in the Grand Slams, it's about officiating yourself. So is there an official rule here? Do they, does it, does, does the Grand Slams essentially use and, or interpret Curling Canada rules? Like how, you know, what's the, what's, what should have really happened here? And is it really just sort of non-offending team decision as well, is the way the, it turned out? The- in the Grand Slams, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this. That it's kind of the wild, wild west, but that's not true at all. Um, there is uh, Pierre Charette does manage uh, the on-game side of things, and there's actually a registered official there for every draw as well. So it's not like officials are taken out of the game, absolutely. Uh, in the Grand Slams, the officials are really only there uh, when the teams can't sort it out for themselves. So in that situation, I think both teams uh, looked at the situation, and Tracy Flurry actually and the team posted a great response on their Facebook page. If you haven't read it, you probably should just uh, search Team Flurry on Facebook. But they essentially said that you know, based on the way both teams played that end, that you know the the strategy of the situation, that both teams believe that Holman was only lying one. No, it was actually Flurry was lying one. You mean? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I. Mean, but yeah. but were they able to see like overhead camera, or was there also a way to see it? Because looking at it at home, it I agree, it certainly looked as if uh, it was they were only close, sitting one. But you you know the 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 overhead or the the video board in the arena wasn't as easily visible from the ice, so they couldn't just quite use it. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, there's no guarantee the overhead cameras are never one hundred percent over always over the button either. So. So you wouldn't do that. But based on that, Holman would have played had had Flurry been lying two and Holman believed that, Holman would have absolutely played the hit and roll. Oh, I, I agree. There's no question yeah. about that. So yeah. and and Flurry said the same thing. So it, so you know, the way they interpreted the rule is that uh there's there is a rule in the book. I don't know the uh the specification of it, but I've seen somebody pull it up is that if if a stone to be measured was moved that uh, the point would go in favor of the non-offending team. What? Now, in this yeah. situation is, is the way both these teams interpreted it is that Holman's team realized their mistake. Emma Miskew said to them, you heard this on, on camera, that, that, you know, Flurry could take two if they thought they had two. And they left it with that, and the Flurry team talked about it, and and they only took a single because they believed in their own, you know, in the way they played and the way the other team played, that they were only lying one in that situation. So, you know, I, I'd throw that out there. I, I know there's some people who'd say, you know, you absolutely take two there. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't your fault. And sometimes this is the failure of of curling's policy of uh, the non-offending team decides because now the non-offending team is the bad guy. But at the same time, I don't think anybody would have would have uh, blamed Flurry for taking two in that situation either. 
I I didn't I didn't get to watch the game, but I read about it, and I also read uh, Team Flurry's uh, response on Facebook. I'm fine with the way it sort of panned out. I think we all agree that curling is a gentleman's game, or in this in this aspect, a ladies game. Like they 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 sold it for themselves, and there's an official there to figure it out if they can't come to terms. Yeah, I think that's that's the issue. You know, had had the two teams had a disagreement in that situation, you know, there there is an official around that they can bring in to get involved. And you know, if both teams agree and are happy at the at the at the end of the day, you know, I you know, I think that's that's uh, the great thing about our sport. Even with so much on the line, you know, these teams are playing with uh, with class and sportsmanship uh, all the way through. Any thoughts there, Kevin? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a, I, I, I think it's a situation where it's unfortunate because the way the sport works, the onus gets put on the other team. And what's interesting is, you know, I've, in the long history of curling, there's been some guys that would even take advantage of that, right? I think there's some teams that would have, even if they had known it was a close measurement, they, but they probably didn't have it, there's some that would have taken that point. Oh, absolutely. I've heard from some of them. I've heard from some of them in this discussion in the last week that, you know, said, well, the rule says, you you know, it's two points, whether you think it's not or not. Well, I guess that's that's the interpretation. And, you know, if you if that's the way the rules read, then you're within your right to do so. But not everybody wants to play the game and win that yeah. way either. So, you know, it, to each their own at the end of the day. I've seen, you know, I've seen teams, and I had my own personal experience that I wrote about on, on my last article. Team actually, and, and I've seen this, it's happened where sometimes they even push the envelope of the rule necessarily. And so, you know, that there's a lot of control that the non-offending ha- team has in those situations. You're playing in an MCA bond spiel, you're playing towards a provincial spot, and all of a sudden, you know, this is a situation where we, we were trying to hit a rock, we tapped the guard with our broom before the rock passed the rock. Of course, it got by and hit the rock in the house. And the, uh, the non-offending skip came and essentially took our rock away, put his rock back, and moved the guard back right where it was. So, yeah. you know, in that ruling, in a lot of cases, you'd have a guy actually say, well, it would have hit the guard, the guard would move over here, the rock would go over here. He didn't. He actually said, no, it's as if you didn't throw the rock. And so, you know, those, those situations will occur. Where, you know, team, I've seen it where teams don't necessarily put the rocks where they would have landed. Uh, they just say, well, I'm going to take it and use this to my advantage. And, you know, gamesmanship like that has existed in a lot of places. I think when you're, you know, right in the midst of, uh, of, a, of a major event and you're on, you know, television like that, you know, who knows what kind of, you know, behavior you might see. Uh, I, I think, uh, um, you know, luckily I think curlers for the most part are you know, in that situation are going to take the, take the high road. They, they're, they're playing in a, in a high level event and they're going to, uh, you know, behave that way. But, but who knows? Uh, it'd be interesting to see if uh, there's a few other teams, like you say, Jerry, I wonder what they would have done in the exact situation in that finals. You know, it's a tough situation for sure. You know, we saw an instance of this in the Briar last year where uh, Carter, Carter Rycroft was called for a hog line violation and uh, they were playing against, it was uh, Alberta playing against uh, Canada and so Cooey's team was playing, and basically uh, Mark Kennedy was like, uh, no chance. Uh, Carter's never close. Throw it again. Yeah, it was the eye on the hog uh, yeah. situation. They actually looked on the replay, I believe, as well, right? Yeah, so In- they actually uh, saw the replay on the overhead and, and, you know, realized that it wasn't the case. You know what? They were within their rights to take advantage of that situation, because, uh, you know, the eye and the hog, as long as it's ruled to be functioning properly, and in that case it was, but it, but using actual video evidence, the eye and the hog failed in that situation, and it wasn't the first time last season where that happened. But it was the first time where you actually had a video monitor within where the players could see the shot and the replay of it. And, uh, you know, it was the same thing. I think uh, the players then, you know, were like, you know, we don't want to play a game like this. And so they gave him a chance to rethrow. So, yeah, it's oh. it, it's it's something that uh, that our game I think is has uh, it prides itself on. Um, how old I how old is the eye in this uh, like eye in the hog line system? That I know it's quite old, but it's been up, updated or something, correct? 
Yeah, I think it's 10 years old now from when it was uh, first developed uh, at the University of Saskatchewan, I believe it was, in Saskatoon. And uh, I, I hear discussion rumors that they're that they're talking about uh, creating a, coming up with a new system. So you look at the technology, batteries, and and all that stuff is definitely uh, um, a lot more. Or in ten years, the the technology has really evolved into smaller, better quality stuff. So I think they're moving in that direction eventually. Well, you know, I've said at length, Jerry, that it. It's the technology is available that we could literally track every, the, every rock in terms of its placement and uh, and be able to know uh, specifically. I mean, we look at the technology in tennis, we look at technology in you know in, in NBA basketball with Sport View and the way they're able to to track things now. And there be technology in hockey that's 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 out there currently from a number of companies. So I'd love to see it because you know personally, I'd I'd love to see uh, like the folks at uh, Curling Geek. You know, rather than having to have somebody in the arena always figuring out where the rocks are, is literally just have a system where uh, the the technology is just populating the location of those rocks, and then we could track so much data on the game itself. And I think uh, you know that'll come eventually. But you know, again, a sport that doesn't have the you know the the billions of dollars behind it, like basketball or or tennis. It's uh, it's a little trickier, and it's something that may come later. But uh, you know, at some point, I'd like to see that. I think I think that the uh, the system in in tennis, I think they call it the Hawkeye system. It might be able to be used for curling specific now. You know, determining when a hand is released from a stone is a little bit difficult. But I think the Hawkeye system would be almost perfect for curling. Well, the trick the tricky part in curling is you're moving around to different arenas all the time and the, it's a question of whether you need to set up technology that's outside of the actual what's on the ice. So something like sport view cameras would be kind of difficult because you'd need to start setting stuff up and then that's costly and 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 time consuming. Uh, whereas the other option is can you place something actually in the rocks, sensors and things like that, but then that might become uh have its own challenges. Uh, gentlemen, I think we're coming up on about 50 minutes here for the podcast. Uh, do we have any other topics you guys wish to discuss? I will take that as a no. Gentlemen, uh, do you have anything to plug? I know you have your uh, your blog back up there, Kevin, Curling with Math. Yep, just trying to write an article every now and then when I get a chance. That's about it for me uh, up until we get in, into the new year. Not a lot of events out here in, in Alberta this year, so I don't know if I'll make too many live events uh, until the uh, the springtime, but we'll see. And, Jerry, you're going to be in Yorkton soon for the next slime, then you're off to Japan, is that correct? Yeah, Yorkton uh, coming up uh, first full week of December. It starts on the 8th, so uh, Canada Cup runs the weekend before that, uh, so starts... Uh, I believe starts late uh, November, maybe the 31st or something like that, or 30th. And then uh, and then heading to Japan to uh, continue developing uh, the relationship with uh, World Curling Tour and uh, contacts in Japan as we've been working on uh, expanding the tour into Asia. So I've uh, been having meetings with uh, Korean uh, and Japanese delegates, uh, talking with... Uh, with China about expanding events there as well, and and I think the future is bright uh, in Asia with uh, with teams and the game and competitive curling as well. So, you know, it's uh, looking forward to it. Uh, Kurosawa is the event, and we'll be doing lots of coverage, video interviews, and stuff like that as well as uh, as Jesse Walker is coming along too. So we're gonna do all kinds of coverage of. Uh, our Far East curling adventures. Now, be careful out there, because I do believe they watch the Late Show out there, and chances are there there might be a whole mob of people when you get to the airport. Yeah, that so, I, I I highly doubt. You may but, become uh, big in Japan. You never know. It could happen. Uh, for our <laughs> listeners who uh, want to broaden their horizons on the whole broom situation that's just going on, I suggest headed, heading over to Dean Gamble's podcast, The Curling Show, and listen to his interview with the uh president of hardline curling archie manavine sorry i pronounced his last name wrong what was his last name jerry blues manavian manavian so archie manavian uh he gives him a uh, good thought from a, a corporate side and then you can also listen to his uh to dean's episode from yesterday i believe with uh with glenn howard and there's also actually earlier there's an episode with uh, ben hebert and mark kennedy uh they touch on it a little bit as well should also follow uh, Curling Zone. Uh, 
there's a, a thread there that's, I think, going to go on for some time and might make a new record eventually uh, on the topic. And uh, there's also some thoughts that Jerry had put up previously. But uh, And, you know, c- keep a lookout for uh, American news coverage to continue. Who knows? Uh, gentlemen, thanks for your input this week, and we will be back again very, very soon. 